the great joy of uh, being in ministry is the God uh, that we get to serve, and uh, not far behind it are the people we get to do it with. And uh, a man that I'm so grateful to call friend, uh, good friend, dear friend, and pastor is uh, Reed Jolly. And uh, Reed's been pastoring at uh, Santa Barbara Community Church for about 30 years. I've known him longer than that. I knew him way back, but uh, Reed's my friend. He's my pastor. Uh, God has given him uh, an, an insight into the mystery of the gospel, uh, the Word of God that's, uh, that's really special. Reed, we welcome you to Chapel at Westmont. Come on up. So it's good to be here. Thank you. I want, to, I want you to know I'm honored to be here. Uh, I started Westmont 40 years ago this month, and uh, they didn't even have a beach in Santa Barbara in those days. And it's just great. <laughs> I want to read a scripture for us. I want us to dine on this. One of the things I loved at Westmont was when chapel speakers actually taught the Bible a little bit, and uh, I know you, you have a steady diet of that, and I hope this encourages each and every one of us. Paul, on his second missionary journey, founded a church in Thessalonica. He was only there for about three months, and then he moved on uh, because of persecution. And he writes a letter very quickly afterwards, and, and this is from the fourth letter. Here's what Paul says. Finally, oh, let me back it up. Just about started there. In our church, we have a little tradition. When the scripture's done, the, whoever reads it says, the word of the Lord, and you say, ah, oh, you do it here too. Okay, well, let's do it with a little gusto when we're done, all right? Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, and not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress or wrong his brother in this matter, for the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be, to God. Thanks be to God. Well, it's been said of all the revolutions of the 20th century that uh, none has had more impact on the way that we live. Not the Bolshevik Revolution, the Maoist Revolution, the Cuban Revolution. None of them has had the impact as the sexual revolution of the latter part of the 20th century. With improved methods of birth control, with penicillin and other antibiotics that we think cure our sexually transmitted diseases, and with abortion being ever ready and available when the contraception control doesn't work, sexual pleasure has been isolated and separated from commitment and marriage. The link between making babies and making love has all been but severed, and we now live in this hooking, hooking up culture. Uh, committed relationships have been trumped. They have trumped marriage, excuse me. And the shame and shock of adultery has disappeared as even our political leaders, as far up as the White House a few years back, confessed to sexual dalliance uh, that would have made previous generations blush with shame. Uh, we could blame it on the pill and penicillin. We could blame it on Darwinism. You remember Johnny Frank's song? Have you seen the video, The Bloodhound Gang? You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. That's very romantic, isn't it? 
A sexual revolution, is, it's been just that. It's been a revolution. It, watch this. It's not that people began misbehaving sometime in the late 60s or early 70s. No, the revolution is not so much in our behavior, but in our understanding of our behavior. We've isolated the pleasure of sex, and it is very pleasurable, from virtually every conceivable restraint. I bet you can finish the, the slogan of the 60s. If it feels good, that's all you got. If it feels good, Okay, that's a little bit better. Uh, and, and in the process, as a society, we have become simply sexually obsessed. We pass out condoms in our high school so that our, and junior high so that our kids can start doing it early. And then the pharmaceutical companies make drugs so that people can do it late. <laughs> Ask your dad. Casual sex, extramarital sex, adolescent sex, no-fault divorce, same-sex relations, the stimulation of pornography, GLBT, ETC, that stands for etc. <laughs> <laughs> I got a, a hard copy mail, a letter from a man in, that had been in our church. He went to a particular Christian liberal arts college in the hills of Montecito some years back, met a gal they dated in town after they got out of Westmont. They married. I performed their wedding, and here's what his letter said. Dear Reed, I had hoped to communicate this in person last summer, but a letter must do. Several years ago, while sitting in your backyard, I had mentioned a sexual struggle of mine due to fear and pride. I did not feel comfortable discussing this with you in detail. Sadly, my desire for pornography grew into prostitution and a full-blown sexual addiction. Though I had tried to surrender this sin to God, my selfish, arrogant ego kept me entrenched in the sin. In part of my acting out, I used the money we had intended to give to the Lord through the church for these encounters. I'm sorry. I take full responsibility for my transgression against God and his church. I also regret not being more honest with you at your home. He had come and visited a year earlier. Unfortunately, my sexual addiction has taken its toll on my life and those around me. My wife and I have been separated since January. Divorce is pending. Although I pray that God will restore my marriage, I know I must face the consequence of my behavior. Uh, and after all that, he says, I hope this letter finds you and your family well in Christ. And then he signed his name. Well, I want to talk about this passage just a little bit. I want to, I want to talk about the passage. I'm going to make a few personal comments about my own life. And then I'm going to talk to you pastorally all in the next few minutes. But what can we say about this passage from 1 Thessalonians 4? In one sense, we can say it's like few other passages in the whole Bible because Paul explicitly says, this is the will of God for you. And in the context, Paul has already told us, he wants the Thessalonians and us, God, this is a message for us from God, he wants us to live and walk in such a way that we please God. How would that be? I talk to a lot of seniors every year at our church, and, and you know, you see if you can fill this one in for me. Uh, oh, you're getting out of Westmont. What are you're going to do. You know, it's like we're getting out of prison or something. But, but you know, you, you know these are the best years of your life, and then you got to figure out, what am I going to do? I have a son graduating from Point Loma uh, in December, and he's terrified that he's actually going to have to wash his own dishes after this. But, uh, <laughs> but like few passages in the Bible, this one explicitly tells us what God's will is for us. It is for our sanctification, or if you've got other translations, same word, it's for our holiness. That noun, sanctification or holiness, comes up three times in the passage, in verse 3, in verse 4, and verse 7. Greek students, the Greek word is hagiasmos. It refers to our purity before God. So if we know two things about the New Testament, or the Bible, we should say, we know that we come to God based not on works, but on what Christ did for us. Jesus justifies us before the Father by his own blood, not by our good works. Have you heard that before? Grunt, if you have. Yeah, good, good grunt. Second truth is that we are also purified by God, not based on what we do, but, but, but based on what Christ did. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he says to this church, it's such a mess. He says, you were washed, you were sanctified by God through the Holy Spirit. But having received both of those things through faith, then the scriptures teach us 
wonderfully, it's a gift to us, that we're now to live this out in our daily lives. So Paul will say to the Ephesian church, once you were darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Live in such a way that you you betray what you already are. Last Sunday at our church, many of you were there, but uh, we were talking about, you know, position and practice and status and, and how we live. And I said, you know, you all in this room, you all got the fat envelope one day from Westmont, not the skinny one, right? Skinny's bad. Fat means my dad has to send $2 million to Westmont and I can go there for a semester, you know. <laughs> but when you got here, I, I came from the San Fernando Valley. I drove up and I had three surfboards in my car and two wetsuits, one notebook, one pencil, and one pen. You know, here I go. Boy, did I have a rude awakening. When you get here, it's not that you say, boy, I studied hard in high school. I'm glad that's over. <laughs> and when we come to God and he's made us righteous in Christ... Well, now the work begins. So in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, the writer says, Strive for holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Peter says, 1 Peter 1, 5, As he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all your conduct. Leviticus 18, Moses is taking people from Egypt into the land of promise, and he says, don't be like the Egyptians, don't be like the Canaanites, be different. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived. You shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. They're to be a different people. You shall walk, not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. Well, what is it? What is this thing called sanctification or holiness? Here's a definition for you from a man named J.C. Ryle. In 19th, he died in 1900, so he's a 19th century preacher from England. Holiness, he says, is the habit of being one in mind with God. According as we find his mind described in the scripture, it is the habit of agreeing in God's judgment, which means to hate what he hates, loving what he loves, and measuring everything in this world by the standard of his world. He who most entirely agrees with God, he is the most holy person. So holiness involves all of life, every part of your life, eating, drinking, how much you eat and how much you drink, and what you drink and what you don't drink. It involves the way you dress. It involves justice. It involves the way you make a beautiful painting or don't make a beautiful painting. The way you make a beautiful photograph. The way you care for the poor. Thank you for that from that world vision. That's all a part of our holiness. But here, Paul kind of uh, zones in on, on what is so fundamental to each and every one of us. Paul wants to see the Thessalonians. God wants us to see the implications of of holiness with regard to the practice of our sex and sexuality. Now, I want to make a disclaimer. Uh, Maybe you're newer to this Christian stuff. Maybe you've never even read the Bible. I don't know. Uh, The Bible is neither embarrassed about sex nor is it uh, hesitant about sexual pleasure. You think about God creates Adam and Eve, puts Adam in the garden, makes a wife for him, and, and Adam has this poem Wow, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And God gives, in a sense, I'm, I'm simplifying things. Don't do this in your Old Testament survey test. But, but in a sense, God, there's two commands. Don't eat this tree and have sex. I'm serious. There's only one positive command there. It's be fruitful and multiply. This is a gift to us. The Bible is not embarrassed about sex and sexual pleasure. Song of Solomon is is an erotic love poem. Do not read it until you're married. (laughs) I'm only half kidding. There have been times in Jewish history where those that weren't married were forbidden to read the book. 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is writing to a church that's in this very sexually charged culture, the Corinthian church. And in in 1 Corinthians 7, he's talking about husband and wife relations. He says, you know, the, the wife's body does not belong to her, it belongs to her husband. And the husband's body does not belong to him, it belongs to his wife. And he basically says, you have an obligation to have sex and to have lots of it. And then he says, there's only one reason for you to abstain, and that's so that you as a couple could devote yourselves more to prayer. And I thought as a pastor, nobody ever does that, so there's no reason to abstain. (laughs) 
sex is God's gift to us, but it has boundaries. It's so powerful and so mysterious, and, and it binds us to another person so tightly, so closely, that sexual intercourse is reserved for those who are in the covenant of marriage. Now, now the Greco-Roman world was, as you probably know, very promiscuous. Men and uh, men were, and primarily, were the, the, the sexually promiscuous, and the reason they got married primarily was for wives to bear them legitimate and legal heirs to their estate. And Paul, in his letters, not just this one, redefines marriage as the context for the satisfaction and the satisfying of erotic desires for the man and the woman. So holiness, if it means nothing else, means sexual purity within the context of marriage. So let's work with this a little bit. Here's what it says. I cited for you the English Standard Version. Uh, This is God's will, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. I'm fascinated with that translation. Uh, Paul uses that word uh, sexual immorality. It's a very tame Greek word. Uh, This is the way it would have sounded in Greek. Um, It's God's will, your sanctification, that you abstain from porneia. You can hear the English word pornography. But the people of Thessalonica were to abstain from porneia. Now, that is a Greek word that would have been very familiar to the readers. And the word simply means sex without the context of marriage. Uh, The word did not have negative overtones. Maybe like our phrase in our time, if you're in high school health class and the teacher talks about being sexually active, uh, there are, there, there's not intended to be any moral overtones on that. It's just a descriptive of, of some behavior. So also this word porneia, it's neither moral nor immoral in the minds uh, of those who are reading the letter. Uh, it reminds me of a time a few years back I was speaking at UCSB. I was in a, on a panel about abortion in a woman's dorm. And there were about 150 women there. And I was the lone representative for, for life. You can imagine how that evening went. <laughs> it was pretty rough. But at one point, I didn't plan to say this, but it, it just dawned on me as we're having sort of a question and answer time. I said, you know, one way to avoid this topic altogether is to wait until you're married until you have sex. UCSB. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> there was a woman in the third row, and she just kind of cracked up, as you just did. And, and uh, she said, raised her hand, she said, you're not suggesting that we don't have sex until we get married, are you? It's what I just said. I said, well, yes, I am. And she laughed again. Now, uh, you know, there's a lot that can be conveyed in body language, and I realized she wasn't being rude to me. She just never heard that before. She'd been taught from being a youth that the sex is, sex is for the body, the body is for sex. You get hungry, you eat. You get excited, you have sex. That's the way it works. So also the first century world. Paul comes to the Thessalonian church. He introduces something to them that's terribly different. He says, you need to take your sex and sexuality into the holiness of God. God has reserved this for the covenant of marriage. So the ESV says, each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Okay. Let's work with this verse. This is from the English Standard Version, a good translation, but I I think they missed it here. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. The Greek word that is translated body there is the word skuos. Can you say skuos? Oh, you're all doing well in Greek. The NIV and the ESV translate this as skuos. A skuos in the New Testament era, in Greek, was a word for a jar, a container, a vessel. So Paul is saying, control your vessel in holiness and honor. What the ESV and the NIV have done, English Standard Version, New International Version, they've taken this word, skios, and understood it as a metaphor, right? A metaphor is where one word stands for another. It's a picture. So years ago in the NFL, there was this huge football player, even huger than all the rest, and he was called the refrigerator. Anybody remember that? I'm amazed you remember that because it was a long time ago. But that that was a metaphor. So the ESV and NIV are saying, this is a metaphor, so let's help those readers in in, uh, California and we'll we'll fix it for them and we'll just translate it as body. The problem with that is that Paul is very comfortable with the word body. He refers to our physical body. He refers to the church as the body of Christ. He refers to Christ's body, both his uh, pre-Christ, 
crucified body and his resurrected body. So Paul is not at all squeamish about using the word body. So why would he use a metaphor here? Probably a better way to see this is that Paul is employing what we might call a euphemism. Here's the way the New American Standard translates the verse. That each one of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Are you starting to get embarrassed yet? A euphemism is a polite way to say something that you don't want to say. When someone dies in our church, I'm amazed how often or how rarely people will actually use the word he or she died. He passed. His passing, he passed away. It's a a polite way to say what, what we dread. Okay. Paul is speaking to the men in the church, and he's saying that holiness means that a man will control his genitalia, his penis, in holiness and honor. And you thought chapel was boring. (laughs) (laughs) Paul is saying that there's a way to practice sex and sexuality that glorifies God in holiness and honor. Holiness, with regard to the the expression of our sexual practices, complete abstinence before marriage or after marriage if our spouse dies, and faithfulness to our spouse or our husband or our wife within the context of marriage. The, The verse is so good. It's teaching that the glories of marital love are God's provision for a man or a woman's sexual desires. I mean, throughout the Bible, you have the goodness of sexual love celebrated. The Bible, again, is not squeamish about sex, But here we learn its rightful context. Not only here, but this is one of the places. Before marriage, we are to abstain from what Paul calls porneia, fornication, with another man's wife. Whether or not she happens to yet be married. Now think about it. As the passage goes on, Paul says it's important that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. So guys... Gal, you're dating someone. Chances are you're not going to marry that person. Are you behaving as you would behave if that person's wife or husband were right there with you? Everybody wants dating standards. There it is. Just behave so that if he or she was right there with you, you know, it's, it's a triple date, the three of you together. <laughs> are you wronging another man's wife? Are you wronging another wife's husband? And after we get married, we're not to defile another man by defiling his wife. Okay. There's the passage. I have spoken biblically, I trust. Now I want to speak personally, very briefly, and pastorally. Personally, I want to encourage those in this room who are prudent and also those who are promiscuous. Those who are prudent, the virgins in the room, and I I wish that it were everyone in the room who's not yet married, I want to encourage you. Uh, I went to Westmont, I graduated, I wanted to get married right away, and it took me a lot of years to find somebody that was willing. (laughs) And, uh, And I was a month away from my 28th birthday when I got married, and I was a virgin, and my wife was a virgin. And I want to tell you something, uh, 31 years of good marriage we celebrated in June, in a great marriage. Um, The details of our sex life are not for public display. But I want to just tell you one thing. It has been such a blessing to have gone into marriage as a virgin with a virgin. And if you're still in that state, I want to encourage you toward holiness. In my marriage, there is no temptation toward comparison. There is no thought of jealousy of previous lovers. Everything that we have experienced as, as the seasons of life ebb and flow is normal because We are all that we've got. Lisa is the only woman in the world that I've ever been united with, and that is a gift to me. I've been a pastor a long time, and I've sat with a lot of people who are are expressing frustration over their marriage or or some, some trouble in their life, and I want to tell you something. I have never yet heard someone say, I know what my problem is. I should have been promiscuous in high school. I've just never heard that. Maybe there's someone out there like that, but I've never heard it. 
But I have heard many, many say through a veil of tears, I can't get this or that out of my head. My, my previous lovers have crept into my present life. Students, I tried it God's way. And it's good. It's good. Now let me speak pastorally. For many in this room, no matter what I say, and no matter how much you agree, you've got regrets already. Maybe it's, temp- it's permissible to say we all do. I- I'm a sexually broken man as everybody else in the room is. But I want to encourage you, don't despair. Our God is in the business of loving us deeply and healing us thoroughly. God's grace is deeper than your past indiscretions, and His love will ultimately wipe away your tears. Begin today, no matter where you've been or what you're up to, begin today to present yourselves to God in holiness. Reclaim lost ground. Pursue sexual purity from this day forward. That's all you can do. This is for the pleasure of God, Paul tells us, but it's also for the joy of his sons and daughters. I like what G.K. Chesterton says. He says, the more I considered Christianity, the more I found that while it had established a rule and an order, that's what we've looked at today, a rule and an order, it did so to give room for the good things to run wild. Lord Jesus, uh, we come to you, each and every one of us, as failures. We come to you as people who are broken, who have regret. Some of us look forward with anticipation to marital intimacy. And some of us look back already to misplaced intimacy. Many of us in this room have deep regrets over past indiscretion. Others are are frustrated, perhaps even angry, over your lack of provision for them in this area of their lives. Lord, would you forgive us our debts, even as we forgive our debtors? Would you cleanse us from past sins that we've committed and those sins which have been committed against us? Would you give us an appropriate vision of an understanding of sex and sexual intimacy? Lord, don't let us copy the world. Don't let us make a God of this. May we see these things rightfully as a good gift for you, from you, but keep us from making sexual pleasure our idol. Lord, I pray you would heal the men and women in this room who bow to the idol of pornography, whether it's on the internet or 50 shades of gray. Lord, we want to present to you right now our bodies, our hearts, and our minds and tell you that we want to cling to you and you alone. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.